Hello, we'll get started with our webinar today on cataloging in Vernon. So we'll get started with some really basics uh, and work our way through to maybe some more complex examples of cataloging. The first one that always strikes me when I'm teaching people how to catalog in Vernon is it's really useful to understand how Vernon thinks. And for myself, it took me a little while to figure out how databases work. It sounds very simple, but if you're not familiar with them, there's a lot of different quirks to how Vernon thinks it can take getting used to. So one phrase you might have heard is that Vernon's a relational database. What this means is Vernon is a database made of lots of little databases. So you can see most of them on the side here in the navigator. You've got a database for all of your objects, a database for all of your people, a database for all your images, a database for all your documents. And each of these are sort of separate databases that Vernon connects together. And then inside of each of those main ones, you've got even more smaller databases hiding. <laughs> so for example, things like department are made up of another little database that keeps all of those terms that you want to use. So once you get that in your brain that Vernon's made up of lots of little databases that are all linked together and sharing information across, it can help understand why it's broken down the way that it is. We're going to spend most of our time in object, but because of the nature of Vernon and the fact that it's a database made of little databases, we'll be jumping into some of those other ones like person and some of these ones we call authority terms. So object is our data file, which is just to say that our object records, all of our collection, all of those details get stored in here. And there's a lot of windows and they all get listed here. And that's because there's over 650 fields in object. Vernon is a one size fits all. It's meant to cope with art objects and natural science collections, historic items, digital works now are becoming a thing. All of that's meant to be recorded in Vernon. And, you know, when you think about museums and art galleries, you're kind of recording all of human experience. And when you throw in natural science, you're recording everything that happens in the world. So there's a lot of things you can write about that kind of stuff. So Vernon groups all of the windows together by theme. And I hopes to make it a little bit more navigatable for you and to make it easier to flip through. Some of you might have custom screens. These will be made by your organization. Sometimes they are groupings of particular fields to make it easier for you guys to do cataloging. A common example is some of our natural science sites have like an entomology window where everything to do with that is kept on one screen. So there are a few places that have created custom windows. So in our demo system, we have an example of a custom window, which is called biodiversity. So that's it on display there. And this is just all the fields from within these other windows pulled together into one place. So you should have pretty much all of the ones listed here, except for the biodiversity ones. You may have additional ones because you might have a custom, but for the most part, what you see here is, is what you should get as well. Depending on your version, you may have the accessory window, which is our newest release. But you can see that we've grouped things to do with the acquisition provenance and rights is all on one window. So this is things to do with how did you get this item? Was it donated? Did you purchase it? How much was it purchased for? Why did you acquire it? Was it found in the collection? Any of those details you can find out about the object's history for your organization. Things like condition and treatment groups together all of the condition details. Documents is everything to do with scanned PDFs or written documents or Word documents or condition reports that have existed as a file. And so you can link that into Vernon. Location, where is the object? And lots of extra details like media and measurement and physical aspects, which is detailing a lot more about the physical description about those objects. Or if you've got natural sciences, things like the age or sex of the specimens. So one thing to remember is that all of these windows, despite having lots of fields inside of them, they only ever relate to one object at a time. I always go back to my fork. So in this case, any of these windows that I open, 
it's only going to relate to this fork. I will be able to look at its acquisition information and it's only about that one record. So at the top here, we've got something called the one line display. And this tells us everything about that record. Uh, if there's a little tick next to the window, that means there's information in that window. If there's no tick, there's nothing recorded. So you don't have to waste time trying to jump in there and see if there's anything in there. If there's a tick, there is detail. If there's not, there's not. Uh, if I look up bars in our search at the top, I can see I've got 14 records and I can flip between them. But again, all of these windows are only about the one object at the one time. So when I flip between, it updates to the information for this object. So that's how you can see what information is in a record. But if you're cataloging, you're often wanting to create a new record or you're wanting to update existing records. If I wanted to make a brand new record, I can go up to the new record button. So your site might have mandatory fields, which is fields that you have to fill in. Uh, in our case, in the demo system, we flag that any mandatory fields should have a color. And so procedural status is the only one we've made mandatory. So this means that I have to give it a procedural status before I can save a record. A procedural status is to say what right that object has in your collection. So is it an accessioned object? Is it formally part of your collection? Or is it considered? Other examples might be that it's an accessory. So it's not technically part of your collection, but it's an accessory to your object. It might be a stand for an object, or it could be a projector that displays your object. There's also things for inward loan, because you want to record all of the object detail, but you are acknowledging that it's not part of your collection. It's on loan to you. And there's also options for series. So this is useful for archival or library collections, where you might have a bunch of papers and each paper might have its own individual record or it might not. And series is saying that this is the overall group record for a lot of board papers, for example. So the overall information about that collection is stored on one record, but each individual paper might be accessioned or have its own unique numbers. So these are just some example procedural statuses. You guys can come up with many more at your organizations, but you'll notice that the main one is missing. There's only four out of five, and that's because deaccessioned isn't here. Because when we're creating a brand new record, we're not going to make it deaccessioned. So we're going to choose accessioned. And today is the date that we're going to be accessioning it. So a little tip is T for today and hitting enter. We'll put in today's date. We've currently got Y for yesterday in development. So that will be coming out in the next version, which is very exciting. And I wish I, <laughs> I, wish I had that when I was doing cataloging. It's very useful. So T for today and in our next version, Y for yesterday. We will put in an accession number. So I wanted to put in the 2010.1 that I always keep typing in. Our version of Vernon that I'm using today requires a year, a dot, and then a number. You will have your own different type of accession number, and it will only allow you to enter in an accession number that matches the rules that your organization has. So I can't just type nonsense in here. It will say that's an unrecognizable accession number. So this sort of protects you to make sure that you're using correct numbers. It's really useful when you are doing cataloging to have a physical hard copy that is used to determine accession numbers. Sometimes this might be shared across the organization through different departments. But in that, you might write the accession number and details at a rough instance of what that object is. It's just so that if anything happened to Vernon, you still have a physical copy somewhere of your collection. And a lot of organizations have the registrar's book. So department, what department is our object? Uh, I'm always prone to saying that it's an archaeology object just for my own joy. But you can choose whatever one works for you or multiple ones. 
department is set up by you guys as well. It depends on what you want. Common ones include natural science or social history, and it can be arranged. There could also be specific modern art or portrait collection or photograph collection. It's generally department is managed by who is in charge of that type of collection that you've got. Object type is a bit more specific. This is where you might say, well, actually, this is going to be a stone tool. And that's not a choice in the list here. So I want to make a new term called stone tool. So the first thing I do is I double check to make sure my term doesn't exist, which it doesn't. And I can click on this plus button with a little square. Uh, and that will let me create a new authority term. So all you have to do is give it a name. You can decide to have a next higher term, which will make this one sit underneath something else. At the moment, there's no need for me to do that, but you could have your departments used as flag terms. So you could have archaeology and all of the different types of objects under archaeology will exist there. Yeah, but that's all the information I need to record for this. So I can close it and say yes to saving. That's going to give me just that one option as a term to choose from. And I can click on it and click OK. And it will put it into my object type for me. So I might say that this is an obsidian stone knife. And so we don't know the artist or maker. But this is linked to the person file. So when I said earlier about databases inside of databases, this is kind of what I was referencing. You can't quite just freely type into here. I don't know, Leolithic, for example. And it's not found any individuals that match this term. If I click OK, it's then going to search for it. So this is a common thing that people do is they think it's a free text field. What you want to do is you want to create that relationship. You can either search to make sure that it doesn't exist, and you can do that by clicking the Options button and searching. Or we can say that it's unable to find anything. So I'm like, OK, I can't find anything. There's no person files that exist. I want to now make a person so that I can use this again in future. It's always really important to search first and be confident that it doesn't exist. The reason for that is that way you don't end up with duplicate people. You don't want to have too many Mary Taylors hanging around. There's quite a few of them. So I found it the fastest way for me to create a new authority term, especially something like complex, like person, is to go to a blank line and use the go to button on the toolbar. When I click on this, it's going to open up the person file immediately and I can create a person. So I'm just going to say that they're known as Obviously, if you are cataloging, you might not want me to create something like this. You might want to put in specifics about the person and more detail. But in my case, I don't know the date of birth or the date of death. But you can add a lot of information in here. Email addresses, web addresses, telephone numbers, and all of those contact details, when they were active from, what nationalities they had, ethnicity ties and community groups there's any categories or religions or political groups and so on and so forth. You can even put in body measurement if you're feeling particularly bold. This has been mostly used by the Australian Racing Museum uses this for their horses. And it's also been used for costumes. And if you've got people with very specific body measurements that were wearing something, or even if it's not that precise, you can still put a category in of large or small. Or if you've got the outfits they wore, you can get a good idea for what their sizes were. So I've got all the details that I need. I can close this and say yes to saving. And it's going to, when I do that, put it straight into the artist and maker for me. You can put in a date, 35,000 BC. And you can choose your different time periods as well. These are some examples of time periods, but we can use a whole range of things. You can say what place it was made. So we can say this came from Italy. 
And you can even choose the role of a place, which is useful if you've got something that went to multiple places to be put together. For example, it might be leather that was crafted in Italy, but the mechanical parts were made in Germany. So sometimes items travel to different locations for different parts of the manufacturing process. Or it might be often in the case of New Zealand and Australia, it might have been something that was originally like a piano that was made in England. And then when it was brought to New Zealand and Australia, parts of it were made from the local timbers. So part of it might be made in England and part of it might have been made in Australia or New Zealand. I always like to think of brief description as being really useful for describing something when you can't see it. So it's the idea that if you ever got your photographs mixed up or you were unable to add photographs or for some reason all of the images in your database disappeared, you could, from the brief description, identify an object from other similar objects. Sometimes that's not possible, but with a brief description, you give yourself the chance to be descriptive enough that you could choose it out of a lineup <laughs> without having seen any of the images. Now, so this is what we call a text field. And the reason I know this is, one, I got the big clue by seeing the zoom button in the corner. The other is down in the bottom right corner, we can see what type of field we've clicked into. And so I've clicked into this and it tells me it's text. If I click into period, it tells me it's authority. Accession number is accession number. Procedural status is an authority field. And date accession is a date field. So if you're ever unsure about what the rules of a field is, you can sort of see down in the bottom corner what field it is. So when I click on the zoom button, it opens up as a window. Now, I quite like this because with brief descriptions, they can be very long. And there's an option inside of your Zoom to increase your font size or decrease your font size. So it remembers your preference. So every time you open up your Zoom window, it will go back to whatever size text you were using. So if you have trouble with how small everything appears on the screen and trying to read in that tiny box, you can make this full screen and read at whatever size text is comfortable for you. There's also options like copy and paste. And a personal favorite of mine is the character map. So here you can look through and find things like the pound symbol or words that have macrons enabled. All of the different Unicodes are all available in here. So it sort of saves you from having to Google them if this is more of your preference. So if you wanted to insert it, let's choose that one. We can click on it. I personally like to just copy it like that and do control C, but you can also hit copy and then you can paste it in there. So it has a whole range. Um, you get a lot of like the pound symbol and yen sign and copyright signs. All of those are available from the character map. Clicking OK will save your changes inside that Zoom window. Media and measurement is the next tab. So I'm, I'm walking through identification because this is probably the most common way for people to hook in. If you've got library and archive collections, you will mostly start from those windows. If you have natural science collections, you'll probably start from the field collection window or potentially a custom natural science window. So in my, my stone tool, I only have the one part. I have no parts. but if I was a teapot, for example, I might say part A, part B, and part C. This would be my teapot. Teapot lid. And then it might be spout, broken spout from teapot. And each of these are now object parts that can be put onto an object with physical labeling. And you can move their locations to different places. You can do condition reports on different pieces. You can assign anywhere you see part reference specific to that. So I could say this spout is this big 
and set up a measurement. If I had, for example, on that piano and I had some loose keys, or I wanted to say there were different parts, I could actually reference the different components and say what specifically things are made of. A general rule of thumb is that parts are removable pieces. So it's things that can come off quite easily without tools. You can disassemble most things in the collection probably, but it's if it easily comes apart from it. It could be a envelope in the back of a book that got donated. It might be a case like this with a teapot and a teapot lid. And it could be part of an artwork where there's, you know, I think Art Gallery of New South Wales has a great, like over 3,000 parts for a lot of Chinese Bibles that were all put as individual parts in one collection work. So there's a range of things that you can do. You'll notice that I click into these and it goes straight away into editing. So when I hit delete, it doesn't really do anything. It can backspace. This is called edit mode. So if you hit F2 on your keyboard, it takes you out of edit mode and you can now hit delete and delete whole rows. F2 puts you back into edit mode. Double clicking also works, but it doesn't take you out of the edit mode. So you can double click in to edit, but you have to hit F2 if you want to go back out. So I would say that this is made of obsidian. And I'm going to theoretically measure this and say that its dimensions are 15 by 7. 5.5. You might have your own reading set up. We've currently set ours up to show inches as well as millimeters. This is very small. And when I change that to centimeters, you can see it changed those readings back into five millimeters, 70 and 150 millimeters. Classification. Um, is how you manage to break your collections down into larger categories. You might use something like nomenclature. You also might use Dublin Core, Darwin Core, ISAD. There's a range of different categories that people might use. Another common one is the Architecture Thesaurus by the Getty. But you can also make your own classification. We do imports of thesauri. So if you are interested, we can help set you up with some classifications. There's a lot of terms in the demo system. We have both the Linnaean, that was one, the Linnaean also for natural sciences, fine arts and nomenclature, and there's also the Getty that exists, but we haven't imported that one. So if I do a search for stone or knife, so many options for knife, knife, stone. Who decided the classification? In my case, I always blame Bill. And T for today will put in today's date. So you can put in a lot more details about other IDs, who catalogued it, again, blaming Bill, why we catalogued it, if there's any reason for that. And also if there's credit line, not so much for a stone tool, but for artworks, there might be a credit line or signature and marks. I'm also going to put in a condition, and then we can say that this object is finished. So my lovely stone tool is relatively stable condition, stable condition with small chip near the top, micro operations, something like that. We can say that the condition isn't good and we can also say that it's displayable condition. You can decide who's made that decision and you can mark if it's the most current one. So that's useful because over time you might build up a history of the condition of an object. So you can update if it's the most current and up-to-date one because one day something awful could happen and this obsidian knife might be dropped and it might break into two. And so I'd need to write a new condition description about this and marking current We'll put that as the most recent one, but we'll still have the reference that in 2022, Bill decided it was a good condition. You might have your own keywords and your own ways of phrasing things. So I'm going to save this record 
And there is a little quirk that Vernon does in that when you save a record and you can click the save button or hit control S on your keyboard, if you save correctly, the record will go blank, which can be very nerve wracking, but it is doing it save correctly when everything goes back to nothing. So when we see this, that is proof that Vernon has saved correctly. Sometimes you want to go back and have a look at your record again, though, really soon after you've done it. There's a couple of ways you can do that. One is to remember the accession number. That's great if you're doing it once off. Another is to click into any field and see that it's at 323 as a system ID, which is a unique number Vernon gives each object record so that it can be found no matter what information changes in the record. And you can say, well, if that's 323, I need to go to 322. And you can go one back from there. That was my sort of old trick. Another way is I've saved the record. It's gone blank. You can go to File, Most Recently Access Records, or Control-A. And that's going to bring back a list of the things you most recently opened. So you can choose your 2010.1 click OK, and it will open it. So there's a couple of ways for you to get those records back quickly. So what information should you add? It is so dependent on the object itself and how much information you have, because as much as we'd love it, sometimes we inherit items that the only information you have is it's found in the collection and you have to do some serious investigation to figure out what it is. It's also dependent on what information your organization wants you to record, especially if you're going online, what do you want to share with the public about this object is another filter that you have to put over your cataloging. If you don't know about any standards that your organization has for cataloging, I would recommend something that is designed for eHive, eHive standards for Project Arc. There's some useful things in here that I think even Vernon audiences can sort of take out of it. One is how do you do your object numbers and thinking about it that way? How do you enter in your dates? All the date stuff in here is less important for Vernon because it records your dates properly. But how do you record your name and title? What classification system do you use? If you are going to use object types, what kind of categories are you going to try and create? So some of this information can be brought over and it's useful to think, well, how do we use these different fields? How can we best catalog? And what is the minimum amount of fields that people should be filling in? So a couple of tricks that I found useful over the years for cataloging. One that I rediscovered again the other day is when you have a lot of windows open, one of the pains is flipping between windows when you have so many open. One, you can sort of click around and open them bit by bit, and whatever you've clicked on will be brought to the front, like so. But again, as soon as you do that, you lose all the ones behind it. You can go to the window menu, and this does let you flip between your different windows. But, you know, you're still only seeing a couple at a time. So I rediscovered this keyboard shortcut, which is Shift F4, and it will put your windows into the different corners, not to the greatest effect on my tiny screen. But if you have a relatively large monitor, this can be very useful because you can have your windows actually segmented to different parts of the screen. You can also maximize your view, which some people like to work in, and use that window function to jump between your different window options. To exit out of maximize, you can use these buttons here, restore down. Now, having all these windows and all these different places that you have to check for information can be kind of annoying, especially when you just want to go in, find something in particular, or you've done an all text search and you don't know why this record has come back for you. Opening each window, scanning through each tab, trying to find where that information is recorded, only to find out that it's just like one field filled in the whole window can be really annoying. So Vernon's got a way for you to see all of the detail inside of a record. It's in our user views window. So first, it doesn't look like anything particular is happening when you open user views. And that's because it often shows the one line display. You can set your own personal user view that you want to have open by default. And that can save you a lot of time 
because it will just show you immediately what you want to see. If you go to select view, you can choose any view that's been made. For example, there might be one specific to library records, one specific to natural science records, something specific to knowing about provenance details of an object, a whole range of reasons. But often I find it useful to click on all fields. And this gives me almost like a little report with every single bit of information about the object in one place that I can scan through and read and just see if this is actually what I want to look at. If I chose a record that had images, so let's choose all of these ones, at the very bottom, there will be a very large scale image for you to have a look through. Knowing the system IDs or knowing the short codes that might exist on, in the system can be really helpful for getting rapid at cataloging. For example, in department, I might be cataloging a lot of social history objects and it's so much easier to just type in a three letter code or even just a single number and remembering that number rather than trying to find and type it out in full each time. So if I click into the social history field and using that options button, there is a choice here that says show IDs. And this gives me a sort of list of short codes that I can use to jump around really quickly. So for example, natural science AOP or PAC, but if I typed in number four, it's gonna bring back art. If I open up social history and have a look at it, I can see it has a short name field and that's SH. So if I remove that and type in the number four and hit enter, it's going to bring back art as an option for me to choose from. If I type in SH, it's going to put in social history. If I type the number seven, I'm going to get the archives and library. So you can save a bit of time by typing in either the short code or the number. And this is true for your person record as well. So Bill's name is already three letters, but if I go to Paul, you can create short codes for yourself so that when you're cataloging, you save time instead of typing your full name, especially if you have a common name, you aren't wasting time trying to choose yourself from a list of people that also have the same name as you. You can put in a short code or memorize your system ID to make yourself unique. So for example, Paul Rossiter's number is 52. So you could either type him in with the number 52 and you'll find him every time. Humans don't always work with numbers particularly well, especially once they get very long. So if you're somewhere with thousands of person records, by the time you get added to the system, you might be 200352. And that's not a very easy number to remember or type. So you can do something like have an acronym or known as, or sometimes I just had this as just a number. And then you can put in the known as field PRT. Just choosing three letters. It could be your first name, your middle name, and your last name. And that means now that if I type PRT and hit enter, it's going to bring him back, Paul Rossiter. So you can do this for people that you often use. So if it's a founder of your organization and you reference them a lot, it's your institution's name. If it's your own name for cataloging purposes, or if you repeatedly reference someone, you can give them a three letter code and it makes it so much faster when you're cataloging to just type that in. And last but not least is the options to copy from previous field and copy from previous record. Really useful if you're doing a lot of cataloging. Copy from previous field looks at the last record you had opened and copies all of that information from that field into your field. And copy from previous record is great when you have a new record because you can copy over the last record and then you can change it to fit you better.